Hello and welcome to another episode of the Dongfang Hour China Aerospace News Roundup for the week of November 2nd to 8th. I'm Blaine Curcio, joined as always by my co-host, John DeVille. We would like to first send a special shout out to our close friends at Go Taikonauts, who are, uh, have been for some time on the mission of providing Western audiences with an English language source on the Chinese space industry. And uh, they are some excellent people over at Go Taikonauts. So Jacqueline and, uh, and Chen Lan and, uh, and Bill, we, we wish you well. Uh, we would also like to mention that yesterday, uh, Jean and I spent our Sunday nights, or in Jean's case, Sunday morning, having a wonderful two-hour conversation with our good friend, uh, Kevin Shu. And so for any of our fans who are looking forward to that uh, podcast, we don't want to overhype, but it was, uh, it was pretty a, a, an excellent conversation. We found out that Kevin speaks, in addition to fluent Mandarin and English, uh, also competent French, German, Spanish, and Italian. He also reads Portuguese reasonably well. So with that being said, uh, this week we have three stories to discuss. We have a couple of updates on the maritime satcom market in China. We also have a short discussion on the Earth observation market and a recent conference. But first, we will lead with a recent funding round and launch from perhaps the fastest moving commercial uh, launch company in China, Galactic Energy. Ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to welcome you aboard the Dongfang Hour. Please make sure your seatbelt is securely fastened. Thank you. And Jean, would you like to get started on the Galactic Energy News of the week? Absolutely. Thanks, Blaine. Um, so Galactic Energy is a launch company and definitely, definitely making the headlines over the past few weeks. So just as a reminder of what has happened, um, first of all, in September 2020, so that's three months ago, Galactic Energy um, raised 200 million RMB in a, a Series A of funding. That's about 30 million US dollars. And that's impressive uh, because that is less than 12 months um, after their previous round of funding, which was 150 million RMB. Uh, and that was in December 2019. 150 million RMB is probably around 22 to 23 million US dollars. And that puts their total amount of funding since their foundation in 2018 at approximately 500 million RMB or something like 75 million US dollars. And that is all the more impressive uh, when you know that the company was founded less than three years ago. Um, so this latest round of funding will probably go towards the development and the scale up of um, Galactic Energy's current family of rockets. That's the Series 1, which is an expendable light lift um, solid fueled rocket. And also towards the Palace 1, which is the reusable liquid fueled medium lift um, launch vehicle. And um, speaking of their family of rockets and speaking of Series 1, um, this is why Galactic Energy was all over the news in the past week. Uh, it's because Galactic Energy held on the 7th of November the inaugural launch for Series 1, and which they succeeded. Um, so the rocket reached orbit, making Galactic Energy the second company, private company in China ever to put a rocket into orbit. So definitely a big event, and in my opinion, definitely putting um, Galactic Energy in the leading group of uh, launch companies, commercial launch companies in China, alongside companies like iSpace, Landspace, and XSpace. And maybe just last point also on this um, inaugural launch, what is interesting is Galactic Energy was able to commercialize this very first launch. They put the Tianqi-11 satellite into orbit. Um, Tianqi-11 being uh, a satellite of the Tianqi constellation of Guodian Gaokou. We mentioned them, I think, in the past episode or two episodes previously. Um, and and so what's interesting here is that Tianqi-11, first of all, is a full-fledged small sat. I think it's something between 50 to 100 kilograms. And that is as opposed to all their previous launches, which were basically CubeSats. And um, what we see here is maybe there's the trend of a sophistication of the Tianqi constellation with larger satellites. And um, the second point also that I wanted to point out was that, um, well, that's... It's really impressive to see Galact, uh, not Galactic Energy, sorry, but um, Guodian Gaoka putting out satellites at such a pace. This is their um, second launch in two weeks and probably their sixth or seventh launch in the past 12 months. So definitely one of the constellation companies that are in China that are putting out satellites into orbit at, a, at an impressive rate. Interesting stuff for sure. And I think um, with Galactic Energy, one of the interesting things about the company has been the 
for lack of a better term, kind of smoothness of their development path. So as you mentioned, John, they were founded less than three years ago. Their first funding round came in October of 2018, uh, and that was for about uh, th 20 million RMB, 3 million US dollars. About six months later, they raised 100 million RMB, and then about eight months after that, they raised uh, 150 million RMB, and then about uh, nine or 10 months after that, they raised 200 million RMB in rounds that were seed round, then angel round, and then pre-A, and then A. And uh, this is, you know, I don't know how much you want to necessarily uh, read into the, the lettering of different rounds, but with a lot of Chinese new space companies, you do see kind of uh, unconventional round order and size and lettering. So you see a lot of A plus rounds and A plus plus and, and pre A uh, in, in this case as well. So um, I think certainly Galactic Energy, they, they've had a very smooth ramp up, it seems. And um, again, really uh, fast acceleration of, of their, their technology and, and seemingly of their business model as well. As you mentioned, they, they secured a, uh, a solid customer for, for this launch. Um, so definitely one of the, the companies to watch moving forward, I would say. Um, Jean, did you have any, any other thoughts on, on Galactic Energy in terms of their technology or their, um, their business model? Anything from your side before we move on? Hmm. Well, it's worth mentioning their, some of their technical choices just to show that um, the, the rockets, what looks like similar rockets on the outside uh, are actually can be quite different. So let's compare, for example, um, apples and apples. Let's compare Hyperbola 1 of iSpace and Series 1 of Galactic Energy. So the two rockets that uh, private, uh, privately operated rockets that reached orbit. So first of all, these rockets are very similar. They, um, they both are approximately of the same height, around 20 meters. They put almost the same amount of payload into low Earth orbit. That's 300 for iSpace and 350 for the Series 1 of a Galactic Energy. Um, they have a very similar structure. They're both um, three-stage um, solid field rockets and both have also a, a small um, liquid field upper stage. Um, but there are some differences. For example, when you look at their um, control system strategy, what um, Hyperbola 1 does basically is they have grid fins that create aerodynamic drag and which can create torque and rotational movement to control the, the rocket. And they also use RSCS, so reaction control systems. That's tiny thrusters that can produce thrust during a very short amount of time um, to orientate the, the rocket. Um, and these need to be combined, obviously, because when you're in the lower atmosphere, um, these grid fins work fine. But when you're really nearly in, in, in space, you don't have any more um, atmosphere and you need the RCS to, to, to do that sort of work. And when we look at um, Galactic Energy Series 1, they don't use that. They really um, rely more on the gimballing of their, of their engine. So that's, that's the first point. The second difference um, that um, you have is regarding the separation um, methodology. So uh, what iSpace does with the Hyperbola 1 is what I would probably call, but that's probably not the right name, um, a cold separation. So what they do is they create um, aerodynamic drag with the grid fins on the first stage, which sort of is creates a, a pulling force that's enough to drag basically that to pull uh, the first stage away from the second stage. And when you look at what series one does, uh, it's more of a hot separation. So what they do is they ignite directly the second engine and the second in engine then, oh, sorry, they ignite the engine on the second stage, which produces thrust to push the second stage away from the first stage. So, um, I mean, on the outside, very similar rockets, uh, but on the inside, you see that there are some technical differences. Um, and maybe just one final note on, on Series 1 to, to point out the differences as well is they, they named their first launch, I Believe I Can Fly. So uh, definitely um, iSpace doesn't do that with their launches. And um, so, yeah, there's a marketing difference there as well. Well, I can certainly appreciate the Michael Jordan reference coming from Chicago in the 1990s. I also have a better appreciation now for the complexities of uh, rocket science. So that's uh, good, to, uh, <coughs> good to know. So Galactic Energy this week, big week for the company, and uh, looks like it has been a big year for Galactic Energy. So we wish them the best. Uh, moving on to the next topic of the week, we have some updates from the maritime SATCOM industry in China. So two, two main updates. Uh, the first one is coming from the K6 Second Academy, um, and it relates to a couple of the points that K6 had discussed at the CCAF a few weeks ago in Wuhan. Um, basically, the Second Academy, in partnership with the China Unicom Research Institute and the government of Zhoshan City in Zhejiang Province, completed China's first low-Earth broadband satellite uh, plus 5G maritime test. So. 
Um, a lot of buzz phrases there. I don't really know what 5G maritime means beyond the fact that it would have been uh, a sort of maritime broadband type of test using uh, presumably a Hong Yun satellite. Now, the article, which is from Wei Jia, it is a very, uh, it's considered a very you know, well-known uh, space industry news source in China. And, and the original article was actually from the K6 Second Academy. That did not specifically mention Hong Yun. Uh, however, we can probably assume, like with perhaps greater than 95% certainty, that the use of the phrase broadband satellite and low Earth orbit and the fact that it came from the K6 Second Academy um, would be an implication that it was using the Hong Yun test satellite that's currently in orbit. And this relates, I think, more broadly to this theme of maritime satcom in China. So the idea that China has this very large fleet of fishing boats, it also has a lot of, of merchant ships. It's basically, there's a large maritime economy in China, which is rather um, technologically less well-developed than, say, many other parts of the world, and it's rather less well-connected. And uh, this this is sort of led to a, a, a land grab of sorts uh, with different maritime SATCOM service providers offering a variety of different options to, to users. Um, so before getting into the second maritime update, which relates to one such option, uh, Jean, anything from your side on the, the K6 Second Academy Hong Yun uh, broadband uh, maritime 5G test? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, just a quick thought that comes to mind. Um, it just highlights how, for example, Starlink, um, which I'm not, I, I'm not as familiar with it as I should be, but seems to have a different strategy as what, what Hong Yun and Kasich are doing in China. Um, how Starlink's uh, strategy basically is really the priority is given to time to market as they're massively deploying their, their, uh, their satellites, but at the same time um, doing the tests. Where, uh, whereas in China, what you have is just one satellite into orbit and doing all sorts of um, downstream experimentations. And based on that, mulling over what sort of constellation we should have. We don't know if it's actually going to be Hong Yun or it will be a concentration of Hong Yun, Hong Yen, and this mega constellation that was discussed uh, earlier mm -hmm. this year. So um, it's, yeah, it's interesting to highlight different strategies, but also putting forward this uh, piece of news um, to, to English speakers because a lot of people, um, well, are, are seeing what Starlink is doing, but we, I mean, I think these tests by Hong Yun don't get that much press. Um, in mainstream English media. I tend to agree that Elon Musk probably does get more attention in the mainstream English media than does uh, Hong Yun and the Kasich Second Academy. So moving on to the, the second maritime update, uh, and this is a, 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 a product release for a, a Chinese kind of, uh, sort of, you could call it a holiday called Double Eleven or, or Singles Day. And so basically on November 11th of every year, so the date 1111, um, there has become this large online shopping extravaganza whereby single people are meant to go online and uh, and sort of relish in their singledom by buying lots of nice things for themselves. And this has led to, uh, you know, all of the big e-commerce sites, so Alibaba, JD, Pinduoduo, etc. They, they have um, created, you know, special discounts for, for singles day, as it were. And it's like literally millions and millions of transactions per second after midnight on, on singles day. Um, and so this year, today, uh, Sinosat, which is a subsidiary of China Satcom, so they released their singles day promotions for their Hai Xing Tong, uh, like maritime Satcom service. So basically, uh, Sinosat operates a maritime Satcom network using primarily China Satcom satellites, but also some other uh, Geocom satellites. And they are increasingly trying to offer kind of um, quite sort of consumer friendly services using basically the satellites for, for connectivity when they are at sea. And so, for example, a couple of the different offers today, um, like 200 megabytes of free data for, for signing up uh, for the service, or there was an offer for uh, 800 RMB. So that's around, I guess, like 115 US dollars or so uh, per year for unlimited voice service. Um, so interesting uh, to see I guess Sinosat getting on the, the singles day, which again is a very kind of B to C holiday. There's not a lot of, of um, B to B business, I think, that gets that gets you know spurred on by by singles day discounts. Although who knows, maybe. Um, but yeah, so so this was released today from 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 Sinosat, and we will see uh, moving forward how their their Hai Xing Tong uh, maritime satcom service take up it goes. I, I suppose there may be some uh, you know lowly people on some boats who would like to be uh, uh, getting some some better connectivity for for their for their RMB as it were. Uh, Jean, anything from you on the Singles Day promotion for the Hai Xing Tong uh, 
Does it make you any more likely to sail from Toulouse over to Shenzhen? Uh, because you can now get cheap connectivity. <laughs> Well, I think the, the incentives are definitely higher on a boat than, say, on, on, on an aircraft with IFC. Uh, on an aircraft, basically, you spend, I'd say, a maximum of 10 hours, 15 hours in the aircraft. So maybe you can resist, you know, just going through 15 hours without the Internet. I think people can still do that in 2020. But I think on a ship where you can spend days, um, well, the, yeah, the urge to buy some connectivity is just growing stronger with every past year. Mm. I suppose there's that element and also the idea that uh, if you are on, let's say, uh, an airplane, by definition, you are already consuming something. Whereas if you're on a ship as, like I say, a fisherman, you're, you're at work making some money. And so if you need to then spend a bit of money in order to make your work, you know, significantly nicer, uh, it may be easier for you to say, well, I'm making a thousand RMB every day that I'm out on this boat. If I'm going to spend 100 RMB of that and then have unlimited internet, that's really great. Whereas if you're already on holiday, mm. um, anyway, well, I think uh, I, I think there's definitely a lot of demand for for connectivity anywhere in China and increasingly um, anywhere you know in, in, in anywhere on any Chinese ship in the uh, well anywhere as it were. So uh, that being said, anything else from Yuzhan on the Maritime SATCOM updates? Or we shall go directly... Oh, okay, good. we will go directly into our last update, which is a short uh, Earth observation-related update. So we saw this past week a meeting in Changzhou, uh, which is, I think, in Zhejiang, but it might be in Jiangsu. Um, but digressing, a meeting of the Asia-Oceania Group on Earth Observation, so AOGO, which I, I'm quite certain is a, ja I think it's a Japanese organization. Uh, so the event was attended by 15 countries and several international organizations. And it was interesting because I think it was, uh, it seems to be an opportunity for Chinese leaders to position themselves as basically having this, uh, this infrastructure that is already in place and that is quite expensive to build and that China as a large country can, can justify building it. In this case, being Earth observation satellites, they have lots of Gaofan and, and other satellites. And so then inviting other countries to come and use these satellites to help solve their um, their, their sort of hot topic problem. So there's a, a quote from uh, Wu Yirong, who's the Dean of Aerospace Information Research Institute under the Chinese Academy of Sciences, uh, which I think captures it quite well. So uh, Mr. Wu mentioned, or possibly Miss, but Wu, uh, Wu Yirong mentioned, uh, Earth observation applications were urgently needed as countries and regions in Asia Oceania face severe, complex, and diverse problems of climate change and sustainable development. So again, basically saying these are big problems. China has uh, done, you know, rather a lot in, in trying to address these problems at home and to some extent abroad and to, you know, certain degree of success and with, to some extent, a rather open mind about, you uh, iteration and and sort of trying to just figure out things like climate change and so i, I think it was just a um an, an example of I, I guess the the extent to which you know china seems to be one back, back to normal they're now hosting conferences with 15 countries uh sending delegates and this sort of thing and and then two i think trying to take more of a, a leading role in um you know deploying and then having this uh having other countries use this infrastructure in, in this case earth observation so uh, anything from you, Jean? And did you yeah. uh, did you have a look by chance as to where Changzhou mm -hmm. is while you were? I, I noticed you were you were typing for something. As, as I, okay. yeah, <laughs> it is in that's Jiangsu. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and 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 this this piece of news sort of joins also what we saw during CCF, where there were a lot of data analytics company uh, mentioning that they were working closely with uh, agencies, Chinese agencies, um, such as uh, the Chinese Meteorology Agency. Mm -hmm. Uh, working together to push some Chinese data, such as the Feng Yun, uh, along the Belt and Road countries. Um, so, which which is definitely beyond just Southeast Asia, but um, uh, yeah, it just so yeah, sort of joins this this um, effort of pushing Chinese data into um, well, having it used by other countries around China. And I think we should be on the lookout for uh, on the star market or the star board, as it, the the Kuzhong bomb. We should be on the lookout for. Um, further listings of, of these sort of downstream application companies in, in the EO sector. We saw PySat list late uh, middle of last year, I think. Um, but I think that moving forward, we should pr presumably see 
because I think it will become a question of, you know, it, it, can investors justify putting up money up front into these companies with the expectation of high growth of a relatively high margin service, like let's say, you know, uh, earth observation software systems for like data analytics. Um, if we assume that companies who are going to be able to to kind of perfect this within China and then export it to much of the developing world, um, I mean, to the extent that the developing world can pay for, for such services, I think it, it's plausible that um, there is sufficient just kind of excess savings, as it were, in China to, to justify um, more of these companies to, to be able to do IPOs and, and find investor interest. So we'll see. But but definitely um, something to watch is China has, again, as we've mentioned before, built out a pretty big infrastructure of space stuff uh, over the last, say, 10 years or, or even, you know, further back than that, but mostly that time, um, and are now really trying to, to get uh, other countries to, to use it, oftentimes for those other countries' benefits. So it's um, you know, not, not as though this is some uh, one-sided thing necessarily. Anything else from you, Jean, for the week, or are we, uh, are we just, just uh, going to go back to... I'm okay, all good. so I will let you get back to, uh, to editing that two-hour beast of a discussion with Kevin, which we are looking forward to uh, getting any <laughs> feedback on uh, once we've posted that. And... Uh, I think we are all good for the week. So thank you very much. This has been another episode of the Dongfang Hour China Aerospace and Space News Roundup. We will see you next week uh, and uh, have a good uh, have a good day. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Bye bye. <laughs>